Hey, good morning once again. We are burning daylight. So today, even though it's Tuesday, uh, well, it's Tuesday for you. It's not Tuesday for us just yet. Um, we are so excited. Over the weekend, we have been hosting a UTSA Chi Alpha group. Woo a handful of them, as you can see behind me, um, along with several of our Hope peeps. There's one of ours right there. Um, <laughs> that'd be Colby. Um, but we, uh, we've been hosting them and we've got several of our volunteers as well that are on the property today that are working hard and just getting various projects done and taking care of on the property. So all that to say, we are burning daylight. There's all kinds of stuff happening. And so we're going to get into the word of God. Today, we are going to be reading in Joshua a little bit in chapter 10 and a little bit in chapter 11. So let's go ahead and go there. On Joshua 10, this is the, the famous sun stands still if you're familiar with that story. Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Hiram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Haran, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Amen. All right, let's look at chapter 11 and also starting at verse 1. It says, When Jabin king of Hazor heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Medan, to the kings of Shimron and Ashaph, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in the Napheth door on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below. Oh, I've got to turn my page. Ah! Lou Herman in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them over to Israel slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. Yikes. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, to Mizrapath Maim, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east until no survivors were left. 
Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. And fast forward there towards the end of the chapter as it continues on with what the Lord did in that particular battle. It ends with, then the land rested from war. And then chapter thir or, sorry, chapter 12 kind of lists all the kingdoms, all the kings that were, um, that were overtaken, that the Lord gave them victory over. A total of 31 kings in all on that side of the Jordan. How remarkable. God was doing a work here to move his people into the land that he promised. And it did require war and it did require bloodshed at the time. But as he did so, God was being honored and recognized as the one and only true God. And all of these kingdoms were seeing that for their very own eyes. All right, speaking of victory against our enemy, um, Psalm 68 is our psalm today and we're just going to read a tiny bit and it says may God arise may his enemies be scattered may his foes flee before him as smoke is blown away by the wind may you blow them away as wax melts before the fire may the wicked perish before God but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God may they be happy and joyful all right, our final scripture reading. Today we're going to be camping out. <laughs> uh, no pun intended there with Joshua and the Israelites, but we are going to be camping out back in Joshua when we get to our devotion. But we are going to read just the tail end of the very end of the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke 24, and this is right after the account of uh, Jesus and the men on the road to Emmaus, okay? So that's kind of the context setting that up. Starting at verse 36, it says, while they were still talking about this, about all of the accounts that happened there with, uh, it, it, on the way to Emmaus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That, by the way, is a great prayer every day, isn't it? Lord, open my mind to understand your word. Uh, he told them, this is what it is written. This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised course we know that to be the Holy Spirit but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high and we get to see that as we go right into the book of Acts from here um, but not today <laughs> when when he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany he lifted up his hands and blessed them while he was blessing them he left them and was taken up into heaven then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and there they stayed continually at the temple praising God all right, let's go into our devotion. Like I said, it's gonna be camped out at, um, or in Joshua for the most part today. And it's called counterintuitive battle. So the first category, we've got four categories here. The labor of surprise, the primary warrior, the united enemy, and the time to attack, okay? All right, so the labor of surprise. Joshua, therefore, came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. That was in Joshua 10, 9. Sudden victories are set up by intense labor behind the scenes, often for prolonged periods. In order to be positioned for surprising success, Joshua and his army had to march through the night. We cannot expect victory without labor. No battle is won in our sleep. That's for sure, right? Battles are won only if we are willing to put in the hard night's work of long marches to fight tired. Just as we should not expect victories to come to us without labor, we should recognize that the sudden victories, quote unquote sudden victories, of other people are possibly are possible because of their long travail or the travail of their predecessors. 
Second category was the primary warrior. It is easy to think that our labor determines our victory. While it is true that Joshua and company marched all night and swung their swords around in the trenches, it is equally true that the Lord routed, verse 10, the Lord delivered, verse 12, and the Lord fought for them, verse 14. In the end, an act of God, the hailstones killed more people than the Israelites killed with their swords. We participate in our battles in the sense that the Lord is the primary warrior. We are not the center of our own wars. God does the heavy lifting. We go into battle confident that he is on our side and as we emerge in victory, it is imperative that we be just as assured that he won the battle for us. All right, the third one, the united enemy. The more forces that combine against you, the better it is for you. What, that can't be right. It is. The more forces that combine against you, the better it is for you. In Joshua 11:5, we read that multiple kings gather together, united to fight against the people of God. We tend to be overwhelmed by one enemy, but God has a habit of multiplying our enemies. This is a blessing in disguise. Why is that? Well, we should rejoice and take courage when our enemies multiply because it saves us time as God will defeat them all at once. Joshua conquered the land city by city, but at times God brought all his enemies together so Joshua could strike a wider blow. The more forces that combine against us, the better it is for us. God will save us time and will glorify himself by overcoming combined enemy attacks. And then the final category, they're having a good time back there, aren't they? The time to attack. There is rarely a bad time to go on the offensive. Attacking when the enemy least expects it never hurts. During the American Civil War, General Ulysses S. Grant distinguished himself from other Union generals as he often attacked immediately after a setback or a stalemate. He was not necessarily smarter than other generals, but he was certainly braver. The devil does not expect us to witness when under interrogation. Demons do not expect us to praise Jesus when they intrude. The coercive forces of government and ideology do not expect us to bless and serve when they oppress. Evil does not expect us to stand firm when we are sick, attacked, or maligned. The time to attack is when we are under pressure. Praise, blessing, and thanks. When we offer these despite the advance of the enemy, we stun the powers of evil into powerlessness. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that that has been uh, a word that has been encouraging to you. Um, remembering that the battle is not ours, it is the Lord's. Um, we always need to praise him and honor him for all the victories that we experience um, in and through our lives and know to keep pressing on and to keep fighting and to keep our praise on, um, especially in times um, of persecution or suffering or, or challenge because that's ultimately um, where we're putting our hopes and our, our um, faith in Christ and in the Lord to do what only he can do um, and to be able to give him glory and honor and praise for all that he accomplishes in and through those trials and tribulations. Well, I pray you have a fantastic day and Lord willing, we'll see you for another episode of We're Burning Daylight. Say goodbye, everybody. Wave to the camera.